The Fuji Cast is an independent loading zone production. Well, I know it was it was last week, Kev, but how did your birthday go? I know usually you would be on the beach with your your beer shots. It was good. It was really nice, actually. We, you were at home, so did you enjoy it as much? Yeah, it was the first time I've been in the UK for my birthday for ten years. Ten years. Yeah, <gasps> uh, it was great because we we did some stuff with some friends and we went to see my mum and dad for the first time in a long time on my birthday. Yeah. And we had a little bit of a garden get together in my sister's house. Ace, it was really, actually really very nice. I really enjoyed there we go. it. So who needs to go to Spain anymore? That's it, really. Isn't well, it? I yeah. wouldn't say that. <laughs> Hopefully next year. <laughs> next next year, Rodney, we'll all be millionaires and in Spain. The definitely. Fuji Cast. Well, I'm glad you had a good time because I, I I did think about you on the day. I was thinking, oh, Kev. Normally by now, I I would have um, I would have had about four or five photographs of you with a beer in hand <laughs> and it'd be about 11 o'clock in the morning there was plenty of beer in hand uh, I'm sure there was anyway welcome to, to the Fuji cast uh, you and your questions from our electronic mailbag and of course um, also now through the Fuji cast private Facebook group we've got quite a few actually coming through there so thank you for those if you do want to send it old fashioned old school styly then click at fujicast.co.uk is still the address um, thank you to our friends of the show, VIPs, very impressive photographers, and especially those who are writing in first time. Thank you for your reviews. We'll have some more of those in Club Indulgence. Kev's, uh, what's your book of the week this week, can you say? I have um, a Peter Dench book. Oh, yeah, a bit of a Peter Dench fan. Aren't I am you? a bit yeah. of a Peter Dench fan. This yeah. is not the one Monty ate. This is the British Abroad, which is great. We'll ah, talk about right, it later. Okay. Um, and uh, today's guest is Anna Hardy, um, who is a mentor and a very inspirational one as well. So that's what's coming up in the show. Um, should we go straight for, for the questions? Yeah, let's go. Go on then. You, let's go. As always, you, yeah, as always, you start. Okay, this is from Nikita Tretiakov from Mainz. <laughs> In I Germany. think you got that right. I did look at that one before I put, popped that across. The I got in a lot of trouble I, for... I bet I'll really fall over that one. I got a lot of trouble for... Um, you, oh, yes. The, you, the book reviews recently. You did, you did, yeah. Yes. yeah. Dear Mr Mullins, don't you know how to say? <laughs> well, actually, no, I don't. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I bet uh, like that. But what you need to understand is that is the... Um, uh, what's what's the word I'm, I'm searching desperately here for? That's the um, oh, uh, what's the what's the not cute? You're not cute. That's the um, oh god, Gemma's gonna go at us now. I can't think of the word. Um, that's the thing about Mullins. <laughs> he can't think of words. I'm as bad. Oh, I, I'll. Um, should we just get on oh, the question? It's all yeah. epidemic anyway. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> Hopefully not. <laughs> Nikita Tretyakov. Had enough epidemics for one year. <laughs> and she says, uh, hello, boys. Is it a she, by the way? Nikita can also be a he. I'd just like to point this out at this stage. That's a very good point. Yes. Very good point. <laughs> I don't want you getting in any more trouble. I'm actually doing an <laughs> online course with him, her, very soon. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, you want to be, yeah. I'm sure it's a girl. <laughs> My very first question to the authors of the show I like so much. Kev, you mentioned a couple of episodes ago that you consider people leaving you their phone number on the contact form as hot leads, in inverted commas. Uh, (laughs) Then says uh, in brackets, hope I don't mess up that term. Was riding a bike when I listened to the episode. No, I definitely said hot leads. Uh, You don't generally call clients, so is there any difference in the way you communicate with the people with and without the phone number? Best regards, Nikita. Well, okay, so to to recap on that, we were talking about contact forms and stuff, and I said that I ask for telephone numbers, although it's not a required field on my contact form, and I use that as an indication. If they like, if they leave me with their telephone number, then that implies to me that they're a hot lead, which means that, you know, they're willing for me to call them and discuss so you used it more really as a method to find out yeah i don't ring them yeah i don't ring yeah, them i don't text them or anything like that yeah. i just use it as an indicator to, a, to whether yeah, they're hot lead you're, or you're sorting hat of good clients do you call them i had this by the way on photography daily last week do we call them clients or customers uh, professional right. negotiator said no they're always customers nearly said clients no nah, clients for me customers go mm. to mcdonald's clients go for high-end services mm, that's okay. in my mind anyway right. i'm not i'm not a professional negotiator <laughs> Um, or am I? Well, Maybe. you might be. Well, I don't know. You tell me. I'll give you £5 for it. <laughs> no, go on, £4.50. Go on, answer Nikita's question. <laughs> um, well, so the answer really is in the question. You don't generally call them, so is there any different? Is there a difference in the way you communicate with them? And the answer is not really. I just I reply by email, pick it up from there, 
Uh, occasionally they'll say then, you know, can we speak or can we Skype or Zoom? People start using that word Zoom now, which gives yeah. me the absolute heebie-jeebies. Why? I hate it. Zoom. Yeah. Is it because it's a reminder of, of this period? Yeah. Right, okay. No, no, yeah. no, no, no. Yeah. Uh, so I'll use Skype or anything else. I'd rather send them a pigeon than use Zoom. <laughs> Um, and that's yeah that's usually how it starts so i I send an email back and in my email at the end i'll say you know if you if you want to organize a call or a a conference call of some kind let me know and we'll we'll take it from there so i don't ring them i don't send them a text message or anything i know that some people do actually follow them up with a text message to say hey send me the email uh, just in case it's gone to your uh, spam folder just you know just so you know it's there and, uh, you know, that I really exist and I care and all that kind of stuff, but I don't do yeah. that. Now that we're in this period of, of, of less inquiries coming in, are you more likely to to think, do you know, I, I need to communicate in the old-fashioned way, reach out and get to these people before they go to somebody else like Neil? Um, not really. I, I haven't changed the way I approach it at all. I, I, I reply as soon as I physically, physically can. Yeah. So that's it. You know, I don't... Um, I don't know. I... I, I Personally, I feel like the whole telephone, ringing people up when they've sent a prospect in email and then kind of ringing them. And I just feel to me personally, I don't have the mannerism for that. You see, I I don't know. You know, I can't. Hey, well, no, Joan, you don't, don't have to go over the Kev, top. No. <laughs> what a photographer! I is awesome. Going to smash your wedding. No, <laughs> would you like to book me, please, before you go to Neil? No, but just a just a sort of. Hi, I just thought I'd call. Um, it's very nice to have received your message. I like to you to hear the voice behind the the email. Yeah, exactly. And, you see, that's the difference. The vo- you, right. just you saying that bit there <laughs> is uh, you know. No, it just makes you a real person. It's a the human touch. I ring them up. They think they've got a Welsh Welsh Joe Pascali on the end of the line. <laughs> no, it's it's not true <laughs> it's not true but do you think I'm, I'm looking the other day i was i was planning um in the studio the, the this in the studio behind where i sit there's uh there's a sofa and there's a a winged chair as well facing is a very dickensian look um but i was thinking the other day about taking this out and making a, a small sort of photo studio in the back because i'm wondering whether i'll ever do another face-to-face meeting here again oh i've given up on my studio i've turned it entirely into a youtube studio have you I, I, in fact, no What's longer. What's happened have... to that seat that I gave you? Well, the, you know that seat you gave me. <laughs> uh, can it... I have it back? Because can you see my <laughs> one's rotted? Can you see it? You've given the <laughs> thing away. Well, it's it's being looked after very well by Monty. No, 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 no. Oh, Monty, bless me, he's not very well today. <laughs> oh no. Um, by Gemma's dad. Right, he's got the sofa. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, that's all right. It's no, that's attic. fine. That's fine. That's fine. It's in his attic. Yeah. Oh, well, he's God. converted his attic to a den. Well, that's cool. Yeah. I like that idea. Yeah. So you got rid of the sofa. It's not in there. No, there's nothing in there now. I have my new desk. I've got my new background. Well, it's kind of forced the issue that you can never do another client meeting. No, it's, it's entirely Customer just meeting. for that now. Right. Yeah. I'll go to the old bell if I really need to see people. So I was wondering about that. I was looking at this corner here and thinking I could set up a really nice little photo studio there. For, for small portraits and stuff that I want to do. And I'm wondering whether, now that people have gotten used to this fact that you don't need to meet any more face-to-face, then the, 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 the face-to-face meeting, as, for wedding photographers at least, has gone. Mm. Whether I, it's important anymore. I think you're right. I actually also have, I've put a backdrop up, a little fold-away thingamajiggy, and I've got that light that I bought yep. a few weeks back, a few months back. Um, I can't remember what it's, what it's called now. Expensive thing, big thing. Well, the aperture. Have you bought three hundred? No, no, I, no, no, no. I still have the aperture video light that I've had mm. all, all the time. Um, no, it's a flash for a camera flash. Oh right, okay. A, One of your Godoxes. Yeah, I want to say AD four hundred. Yeah, don't know who makes it. Powerful one. Yeah, let's go, Dox, isn't it? Uh, there's two brands in the Niwa and Godo. Anyway, they're both the same thing. One's mm. one they just rebranded. Anyway, I got one of them as well. So I, I do have a little bit of a space um, for for that. And that's the whole point. But yeah, it's I have my working desk, which is hasn't changed, and then everything behind me is carnage. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm, I'm thinking about getting rid of that chair because that'd be a good space there for a little photo studio. Mm. The chair now, it's just, I can see it's rotting. I don't know what's going on with it. Quite like it because I like that old leather look, but. Um, mm. The only thing that it ever gets used for now is is um, is for me sleeping on in the afternoon to it, get away from it everyone. It <laughs> does take up quite a lot of space, doesn't it? It does, yeah. And this table could all go. See, I like. I'm quite. I quite like the idea of the minimalist movement. Mm. I like. Have space. you watched the videos, by the way, on YouTube? The mini- yeah. minimalist. Yeah, videos. I love the Matt Devalia 
Um, uh, no, YouTube. yeah, he's a different guy. Yeah. Well, he he was the you know the minimal, minimal, minimalist. Minimalist. Another one. Minimalist. Uh, you know the movie called The Minimalists on Netflix. I think it's on Netflix. Oh yeah, yeah. I haven't seen it, but I know of it. Well, yeah. he that was he directed. He made that film. Of course he did. That's why it became famous, Correct. and that's why the YouTube following. That's Correct. where it came from. Yes, Correct. yes, 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 yes. I even joined his Patreon. Did you? The only Patreon I've joined. And uh, he he gets around about somewhere between twenty four and sixty four thousand dollars a month from <laughs> Patreon alone. What? Yeah, that's it. Patreon. All we we can do that. All mm-hmm. we have to do is become very very good looking and very very good at stuff. Well, look, Brandon Stanton. Funny you should mention uh, Patreon because I was um, editing um, by the time this episode comes on the photography daily one that i had on this subject will have gone it was saturday this is the humans in new york guy isn't it it is brandon stanton's the guy behind humans in new york and we were talking about patreon and why people use patreon and uh, jack lowe the lifeboat station project photographer was talking about the fact that um he was trying to get his followers used to the fact that whilst it's free to consume what you see it's not free to actually produce what you see and um he mentioned brandon stanton as being a particularly prolific user of uh, the patron system mm. and i think if i go down here we should see how many members he has just click there, there you go. go whoa my words Twenty thousand four hundred twenty-four patreonics patreonics yeah that's <laughs> what i call them <laughs> And uh, at roughly... Well, if we take a... uh, No, I actually have made your mouse work again. Oh. Yeah, look. Oh, look at that. Um, Rough... Let's just take a Well, let's go for the the middle one. Three Three dollars. Okay, so uh, 20,424... It's uh, ninety one thousand. No, it's something. not. It's sixty one thousand two hundred seventy two. Oh yeah, sixty yeah. yeah. one thousand two hundred seventy two. Just on Patreon, dollars a month. That's just on Patreon. That doesn't include yeah. the Humans in New York book, the story, the brand, the copyrights. I mean, that guy. I, I wish him absolutely. He has a huge following. All the best of luck, because all he was was a guy with a cheap camera who decided to just stop people in the street, take a really rubbish picture in the early days, mm. Mm. and then ask them their story. And he did it, I think he started it on, what's that thing, um, that blogging platform, Tumblr? I think something like that. Mm. I think that's where it started. And then, of course, it became huge. They've made a movie about it and all sorts. Oh, yeah, good for him. I like That's a good news story. Amazing, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. The, the point of this whole conversation I had over the weekend with Jack, who was talking about people doing long tail projects and what pay, being, you know, having your own patron system means and does, is that you don't always have to do an awful lot more. It's because people want to support you because they 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 feel that they've gained something through either listening to you looking at your work and and that's what this this whole system's about mm, mm. there is a difference between producing work that's free and people consuming work that's free and then actually those very same people understanding that there's a value to the time that somebody who's spent doing it correct but also there's a um a philanthropic element at play isn't there because yeah, there's going to be yeah. some people who are probably giving him five thousand dollars a month yes yeah you know yeah and because they like what he's doing they like the gift he's given to the people in new york well, ultimately look at this and the, the, i've left it there L- select a membership level okay there's three one there's a 150 a three dollars and a five dollars and they're all the same and they're all the same everything's the same mm. there's no difference mm. it's it's about what you can afford mm. which i think was a really yeah, that was an enormous long answer to a question, wasn't it? I think we went off on the tangent, yeah. as always. Right, one from Facebook. Matt Fletcher. Hello, guys. I'm look. I'm a long-time Fuji shooter, but never got into video. I've got an X, X100F and an X-Pro3, but I'm looking for something to shoot some video, as I recently purchased a friend's DJI Ronin SC Gimbal. Uh, oh, I'd like that one, actually. Good, I like, good I like, gimbal, that. Well, I like that because it has the forks that go around the camera instead of behind the screen. Mm. So you can see the screen at all times. Mm-hmm. I'm looking at three cameras right now, the X-T3, the X-H1, the X-T30. I'm currently working in China, and these can be picked up at second-hand markets for a good price. What would your suggestion be for a first-time video shooter and a gimbal to use? Right. Well, I'm going to straight away with a gimbal. I'm, I'm going to give well, the DJI Ronin SC. That gets my vote because it does have the forks at the side. I don't know if they're called forks, but... No, so no, ba- balances yeah, yeah. the camera in the middle. So, because the problem with traditional small gimbals is that you always obscure the screen somehow, mm-hmm. which is a proper pain. 
So that would get my vote straight away. With, with regard to the three cameras, well, I mean, I use an X-T3 and an X-H1, but I always put the X-T3 in the gimbal because it's point to put putting the X-H1 in there because you're not getting the advantage of, of the stabilisation that the X-H1 has. No. Well, that's true. You don't need the stabilisation on the no. gimbal, do you? No. In, I mean, I, uh, I don't think it's... And you're going to get a uh, better common. sensor, aren't you? With yeah, the, uh, I don't X-T3. think it's uncommon yeah. knowledge that I didn't really like the X-H1, but I think <laughs> from a filming point of view, yeah. it was very good when it came out. But yeah, the X-T3 and the X-T... If you get an X-T4, then, then Bob's your uncle. Um, probably some of them kicking around secondhand now. Well, X-T4? Yeah. Really? Already? Yeah, some people buy things. Some people just yeah, buy, buy things because they like they're opening waiting, them. Yeah, only because they're waiting for the X-T5, which is now... Yeah, they so, like so, opening so, things and then... Do you? The, so? the excitement of opening it. Then it's gone. And then it's gone like well, a cla- bubble. Classic gas, isn't it? Like, what about the X-T30? X-T30 is short-form video, though, isn't it? So you'll still do yeah. your 4K, but you won't have long clips. Yeah. So I would say definitely it's down to the X... What, he's already got an X-Pro3, right? Uh, he's got an X-Pro3, which, which you know, we can discount for the video work, can't we, really? Well, it will do it, but again, it's yeah. it's short-form video, and it's not, you know, it's not going to be quite as good. You can still do 4K on it. And the X100F, which I, I've never felt... It, I've made some sort of B-roll stuff, but I've never felt that's a video camera for me. I would go... Nowadays, they're bringing out 8K this, 8K that, 8K televisions, 8K cameras, 8K cornflakes, 8K footballs. <laughs> There's all 8K, so I would say 4K. Things that will do 4K is probably, you know, a reasonable, reasonable mm, thing. Yeah. So I'd be going towards XT3. But if you can, save a few Chinese yen. Is it yen in China? Mm-hmm. And uh, try and get an XT4 if you can. Right, okay. That would probably be my my advice. And definitely the DJI Ronin gimbal. Right. Let's let's have one more question, then we'll we'll do. Um, uh, I've got a really interesting question from. Them. Uh, <laughs> He's, he signed it off, Gary, Ni, nee, and Estonia, because you remember we had that conversation about his uh, name. Ah, yes, yes, we did. Uh, he says, uh, I've got four kids. You're not going to get in trouble with names again, are you? <laughs> I've got four kids from eight through to 28. Yeah. So, cool, that's a hard life. Wow. So I'm asking this question more as a dad and potential source of wedding funds rather than as a photographer. How many children does he have again? Sorry, he has... He's got eight through 28, so that's 20 kids, isn't it? <laughs> no, but how... <laughs> no. He'd be on a channel... He'd have his own very own Channel 4 or Channel 5 film. Uh, four. Four. Four children, eight through 28. So at some period in his life during that time, the television broke down. <laughs> yeah, I would imagine so. Uh, darling, I have something to tell you. <laughs> what? Did you scratch the car? <laughs> uh, not quite. No. Uh, would you encourage your own kids to spend £20,000 plus <laughs> on their own wedding yeah. or would you think that that money could be better spent dot 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 honest answers only please boys wow 20k 20k what spent on a wedding mm. is it no well, so let's just say jack is about to get married yeah but he's he's um wife to be's parents are paying and i'm very <laughs> traditionalist in that respect <laughs> had this conversation I- <laughs> over, yeah. i'm just buying the wine yeah. um I, don't know, I mean, these days, though, both sets of parents do chip in, don't they? So it's a half and a half thing, often these days. Well, rightly so, mm. being, being the father of a daughter. Yep. Quite right. I knew you'd say that. <laughs> well, you know, the thing is, I, I, I remember this email coming in, and I thought, that's a really interesting question, is, because, yeah. you know, 20 grand is a lot. It is a lot. A lot. Yeah. I spent just under £500 on my wedding to Gemma. <laughs> just under £500. Um mm. Uh, 500 pounds well spent of course yeah. but 20 grand i mean ultimately if the kids children are you know independently wealthy and they want to spend that money and it's you know it's not going to land them my, my main concern would be debt if it was going to land them in debt yeah don't do it then i would encourage them not to but you know as we know as as, An- as andy will know gary andy <laughs> will know with his children not the one that's eight but the ones that are probably 14 upwards what you say to your children is not often not necessarily everything, always what they, they do. And, uh, you know, ultimately, yeah, it just comes down to debt. I, I would like them, I, you know, I, I would love my kids to have a massive, beautiful wedding and yeah. spend £100,000 on it if they could afford it. Mm. And it was, uh, you know, just a small percentage of do their income. Do you ever feel when you go to a wedding? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, we're allowed to be interrupted because my young lad has just, come in, come in, come in. It's just arrived with beer. This Don't look, drop mine. Don't this, drop my one. This looks <laughs> wrong, doesn't it? Well done, Thomas. <laughs> Good boy. Yeah, by the way, we're recording this show yeah. at, a, at a family get-together. Thank you okay, very much. Bye. bye. 
Mm. Oh, <laughs> thanks, Thomas. Thanks for the beer. Hi. This take. The, pardon? Do you want crisps? <laughs> Not just yet. No. I don't know. Does Kev want crisps? No, I'm okay, thanks. No, right. Thank you very much. Okay, bye. 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 This takes us right back to <laughs> lockdown, doesn't it? <laughs> but half the fact is we're both in the same room now. Look. Yeah. Cheers. Um, where were we? Uh, Twenty thousand pounds on a wedding. <sighs> oh yes. Do you ever go to a wedding and look around you and think? This doesn't feel right. Some of the stuff that you see. Uh, yeah. Now, this is a really difficult question, and I'm appreciative of the fact that we might have some clients listening. <laughs> Occasionally, but I always, I always genuinely, and Gemma will laugh her, you know, her little head off when she hears me say this. I always try and look at the positives in things. Right. In life. What? I can hear her laughing already. Um, but especially at weddings, because it's very easy to mm. prejudge and to think these people don't look like the kind of people who can afford this. And that's, oh, no, I that's, wasn't suggesting that. No, 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 that, I, no, I know that wasn't, but that my, my thought process is going along this way because sometimes that's what happens in our heads. You know, you think, hang on, you know, this guy's a, a milkman and he's spending 30 grand on his wedding. And then you just think, well, is he getting himself into loads of debt or whatever? But I, I you know, and, and then you look at some of the things they might have, chocolate paintings or whatever. But I always typically think, actually, ultimately, if it's what's making them happy, then that's the most important thing. But I hope that they're not getting into you know yeah. financial difficulties from it. And I'm fairly sure that most people don't. You know, they're, they're, people are sensible, aren't they? Yeah. You know, apart I from loved, our, I loved our wedding day. We had a great day. I didn't want it to end. And in fact, for the first week of our honeymoon, we were quite depressed and say, oh, I wish it was last Saturday That's again. not good. If you're depressed on the first week. No, 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 and only in the, no, we, we had a great time, but we were just a little bit, oh, I wish it was Saturday all over again, which is a sign of a good party, of yeah. course. Yeah, so, yeah, and, yeah, and, yeah. Um, and, and I'm pleased to be working in a business that, that does that. It's just sometimes when you see some of the things and you think, this goes back to our alpaca um, conversation of last week, I think it was. When you know you wonder whether some stuff that's bought for weddings is really necessary, but yeah, yeah. but then you know a lot of people buy things, do things just yeah. to be a little bit different, and and that's good. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, you yeah. know, well, although alpacas, I think I'll draw the line of that. Alpacas was a bit Llamas weird, wasn't it? Alpacas. Yeah, llamas, alpacas. Right, let's do a few of these uh, club indulgence oh. um, reviews. So I get to practice my fast speech. Well, no. Uh, well, <laughs> I was going to say, do it in your normal speech. Oh, I couldn't I've been understand a word you were saying with I've been your practicing. fast speech. Have you? All right, then I'm we'll... going to do one normally and one fast. Okay. Um, I'll start. This is from Quiggle. At the beginning of the current global crisis, I found this podcast makes my face hurt from the smiling, informative, and funny. The guys gel perfectly. Excellent cast. Thank you very much, Quiggle. This is from Snapperdale. A must for anyone at any level of photography. A fun and informative. Is this your fast one? No, this is my normal, okay. normal boring speech. Fun and informative podcast. I have listened to every show, some even multiple times from the beginning. You don't have to be a Fuji shooter, as they cover everything. And the interviews are great. Keep up the good work. I've got this horrible feeling I've printed some of these out twice, by the way. Well, I just read the one you read out. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, Daisy Sneep? Daisy Sneem? Daisy Sneem, is that right? Yes. Amusing, interesting, mind-blowing, in brackets almost, and good fun. Beware of, oh yeah, beware of complaining. Their wives deal with that department. <laughs> right, you ready for this? This Go is on, from then. Nico Bouchardi. Who? Nico Bouchardi, and he says... Yep. <gasps> Absolutely brilliant show by the two best friends who have good banter. What I like most about them is the breadth and guests are... Bro. No, I, I would do it at your normal speed. Blew it. It's the alcohol. Yeah. Absolutely brilliant show by two friends who like a good banter. <laughs> what I like most is the breadth of the guests who provide a good insight into what it means to oh. be or become a photographer. God, you've gone into Jack D now. And leave out, most of the time, never-ending gear conversation. <laughs> Keep up the great work. Yada, yada, yada. Steve L, thank you. What a delight this podcast is. From the very first one, they hit the ground running. The technical stuff is really, really useful and informative, and their on-air humours, just fantastic. They make me laugh out loud anyway. You're easily pleased, Steve. It's obvious that they're good friends, and this shines through their work like the words in a stick of seaside rock. What a good metaphor. Or is that an analogy? I always get the two confused. Well done to you both. Oh, have you got one more? No, it's too late. Too late. Too late. I've been practising my fast speech all well, week. No, well, you can have another one next week. Uh, remember that if you did indeed write in with one of your reviews, um, you always have to consider... You're our favourite listener and we mean it. Right, time for uh, this week's interview. 
Anna Hardy is a family photographer based in the northwest of England in Manchester. And let me quote a little from her about page. Food obsessed, adventure loving mum of two, navigating the chaos of family life with my pair of hilarious chatterboxes. 15 year old Joe, in brackets, kind hearted, inherited my human dustbin attitude to food. And five year old Huey, in brackets, fearless favours more of a baked beans or get lost approach. Anna has without a doubt become one of the UK's recognised family specialists, speaking at conferences and workshops and now running her own inspirational mentoring business for new and established photographers. In fact, within the interview, you'll hear something that if you're a professional, you may you may recognise that feeling, as she calls it, of the, the hamster wheel of shoot, edit, shoot, edit. Life, of course, has changed quite dramatically, but it but it's given many a time to reassess where they want to be. Today, though, we're concentrating really on the family side of a business that has that has built from the ground up a real graft from scratch. She runs an outdoor photography business in terms of not working from a studio, and so this is an interesting opportunity to hear how that works as a business too. And also. Uh, we do touch on the idea of masks in shoots. Uh, there's something I, <laughs> a year ago, if you'd have said that to me, I'd have, I'd have probably looked at you square in the eyes and said, what are you talking about? Well, we talk about the masks, in particular working with them with smaller children and the, the social effect of. This is Anna Hardy. Coming up for 13 years in the business now. It is 13, isn't it? Because I've read 12, I've read 13, and I always get lost. I think, is the 13th year, does that mean the, the 14th coming up? But you, <laughs> you, you've been in it a while. You're a very respected social portrait photographer based in Manchester. But let me take you back a, a, over a decade. Where, where did it all start? Thank you. Yeah, it's, um, do you know what? I, I'm not entirely sure whether it's 13 or four. I think it was 2007. So whatever that, my whatever my well, terrible hang, math. Hang on a minute, Annie, you were the teacher, not me. I expect that to come floating <laughs> off your tongue. <laughs> not a maths teacher, though. I hate to that, although I probably should be able to subtract <laughs> seven from 13. But um, yeah, about 13 years. Um, and uh, I was. Uh, what was it? Yeah, I was. I had been a teacher before that, like you said. I was a, an English teacher um, in secondary school, and I left that to travel um, and in fully intending to come back to it. But I bought a camera when I was in Nepal. I got a tax rebate um, and bought um, my first SLR. It was a film SLR mm. in Nepal, and kind of just got the bug really. And then when I came back. I had not long afterwards I had my eldest son Joe who's now 15 um and he I kind of like all parents do start taking loads and loads and loads of pictures of him um and it kind of just snowballed from there really so I I got a um like a a sort of very low maintenance admin job that didn't take too much brain power so that I then had the sort of energy and capacity to start building the photography business in the evenings and weekends um and that's that's kind of where it came from really so you took a real leap of faith then didn't you you'd been working as a teacher it's a good career a teaching career and you thought right I'll remove myself from that because I need the I need the time for the other yeah it was it was it kind of felt quite natural I mean I I loved teaching and I, I possibly loved it a bit too much in that I, I remember my head of department saying at the time, she was like, it's wonderful that you're doing all this preparation and putting so much time into marketing and things, but you know, you've got to ask yourself, is it sustainable? And I think at the time I had no children. So teaching was the most important thing in my life. So I was happy to throw all my time into it. But I think once I had my son and obviously then your priorities shift and not that teaching became unimportant to me but obviously you have other things that are <laughs> more important your, your own yeah. family um I, I don't I think I might have just driven myself a bit nuts actually trying to balance both being a mum and teaching English full-time um I don't know that it's yeah I think I would have just sort of burnt out a bit really and then that coupled with this this love for photography that I developed while I was traveling it all kind of just was a bit it's all happened fairly serendipitously mm. is that a word? <laughs> but there is also quite a difference between um having your having your slr thinking I, I love that i'd like to do that and then actually doing that so yeah. um we talk a lot about finding genre or genre finding you um 
Yeah. Was it that yeah. way round for you, or, or did you were you were you a bit rudderless when you started? A lot of people are. Yeah, I was completely rudderless, and um, I kind of all I knew is that I just wanted to take photos, and actually, I remember just not really knowing kind of how or where I could do it and and having a very sort of like machine gun approach to it of like, well, I'll yeah. just shoot everything. Yeah, yeah. And um, I remember take, going to like a real sort of, um, there was a, a, it was like a portfolio review for really kind of sort of like fine art photographers in London. And I kind of just took these really <laughs> terrible pictures down. But now I look back and I think, oh my God, I can't believe I actually did that. And I mean, they very politely told me, you know, I don't think you're quite there yet. <laughs> and um, I was like, oh, okay. But they also said, you know, hardly any photographers can actually make a living from just, and by fine art photography, I'm, I don't mean kind of, I know now often people talk about like fine art wedding photography or for, but I mean like as in sort of, you know, selling pieces, individual pieces or, you know, mm. for book covers mm. or things like that. And a lot, they sort of said, you know, most people have another type of photography that they make their, you know, that they pay the bills with whilst producing, you know, individual images, if you like, for consumption. Um, so then I thought, okay, right, I need to think, rethink this, what kind of photography should I do? And it, I always knew I wanted to photograph people. That that was never in question. I never sort of wondered about product photography or landscape photography or anything like that. It was always people that I was really fascinated with photographing. Um, but yeah, and I guess I sort of, I went initially for weddings, probably if I'm being honest, because I thought that was my best chance at making a living from it. I've never been someone who's been like, oh, I love weddings. I love weddings. I, I grew to really love weddings through shooting them. I really fell in love with them, but I didn't kind of think I love weddings. I need to work with them. You know, that wasn't my motivation. It was working with people and trying to make a living as a photographer that really led me into that initially. So where did the portraits start to, to work for you then? So that came, happened quite organically, really. After a few years of shooting weddings, people whose weddings I'd shot would then have children and would then come back to me and say, would you now photograph our family? Yeah. So it was really led by them, to be honest. Um, and it was then after that kind of snowballed, obviously the more weddings you shoot, then the more are having kids and the more come yeah. back to you. Yeah. I started doing it regularly and I just started realizing that this was really where my passion was. I absolutely loved it. And I was looking forward to my family shoots far more and they were what was really making my heart sing. So that's when I decided to really grow that arm of the business. Um, and I did it alongside weddings for several years um, and very happily shot both. But in the end, I just found after, I mean, I've been shooting weddings for well over a decade and I started feeling like <laughs> I was identifying more with the parents than the people getting married. <laughs> I felt like I was maybe not too old for it, but mm. you know, I think you have to really empathise with the people yeah, you're yeah, shooting, I, I don't agree. you? Yeah, yeah. Well, wait till you start feeling like the grandparent then. <laughs> But you're, 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 of course, you've gone now from from that industry. But, but, but well, um, my, my eldest is fifteen, so I mean, I'm hoping he's a long way off it, but he's fairly closer no, to no. yeah that point. Graft is so important to build a business. Uh, I mean, it does not happen overnight. You prove that by you know thinking right. Well, I. I'll fund what I really want to do with what I enjoy doing, but it's on the fade out. Um, it sounds like you're, you know, it, it took you a, a good decade to build this business, or, or am I, or am yeah. I wi wildly um, out from the mark there? No, it did. I mean, I, I, I did it full time after about. So I, I did it alongside my admin job for like one to two years, and then I, I was full. T I've been full time for sort of well over. 12 well yeah well over 12 years so I I did it as a full-time job very early on and was able to make a living out of it however I think I really kind of I wouldn't say it was like a, a wildly sort of 
I, I kind of just scraped by, I think, for a long time. And I think I was quite complacent. You know, I didn't really, I didn't ever do any marketing. I never sort of, I would just sit and wait for inquiries to come in. And happily, they did. And I would always have just enough without doing anything. But I think as in more recent years, as the photography industry has grown exponentially, and there's so, there's so many more of us now, and so many amazingly talented people, it's just not it just doesn't cut it to sit there like that you know and and wait I think when I first started because it was a while ago actually shooting in a more documentary style shooting weddings in a more documentary style meant that you were really quite special like there weren't that many of us around and also being female I think was you know a lot of people were like oh you know it's nice to book a fee and whereas now quite rightly so neither of those things are uncommon yeah. so you know your point of you have to fight more well not fight more but work more for the for the business that you get and I think that's been the case for at least five years um so I think after sort of coasting and and sort of just I think as well part of it's you, you sort of can't quite believe you're doing it you get that imposter syndrome you feel like well I'm not really a proper photographer well, I tell you, yeah, a lot of photographers have that don't they yeah it's crazy and it, that that I had that for years and years and years and but then you know probably for the latter half of my photography career I thought right no this just isn't going to cut it anymore I need to get serious about growing the business and treat it like a business it's not a hobby this is paying my bills and you know and since then that's when the business has really grown you know what you put into things you get out of them don't you, you do, so. yeah. why, why did you choose to work uh, predominantly outside and not in a studio um it just doesn't really interest me in a studio if I'm being honest I like the variety of um every session that I do is different um and particularly because I'm wanting to tell a story about that family um like I always obviously if it's in their home then it's completely unique to them but also if it's outdoors I always try and base it in a place that's special to them where they go anyway where they've got good really happy memories um and if everyone's just coming to the same studio I just feel like I can't tell that same story and I want to be in their world I don't want to bring them into mine I feel like my job is finding all the magic in mm. their world that's what I'm there to do it's all about them rather than them coming into my space if you know what I mean are, so, are, are you back at work now with um uh, I know in Greater Manchester where you are no you're you're back inside aren't you at the moment but uh, yeah. what had you had you gone back out again well I've been throughout the strict lockdown I was doing doorstep shoots which I know loads of photographers all over the country have been doing um and that was really great actually just to kind of keep um to kind of keep your hand in as well you know what it's like when you've not picked your camera up for a while you almost get the fear about <laughs> picking it up again yeah. so it was really good to keep Keep, sort of keep shooting it's also been very good actually for business because although the doorstep shoots themselves were really not sort of sustainable financially I mean you were you ended up doing them for far less than minimum wage really the amount of hours it took to do them um but they were great for getting known in your community you know and a lot of people have then gone on to sort of book proper shoots afterwards and so that that was really good and actually I shot a commercial campaign um, for um, a reusable nappy brand, um, a cloth nappy brand, um, Babram. Am I allowed to plug them? Yeah, <laughs> yeah why, why, why not? Yeah, yeah, they're great. Um, Baba and Boo, and I've sh I've shot for them before, but normally oh. we'd get a studio or hire like hire a studio space and get them to come to us. But she saw the doorstep shoots and said, "You know what." let's shoot them like this because it's obvious time. And so I traveled around Manchester shooting lots of real families with the babies in the cloth nappies on their doorsteps and in their front gardens. And we shot the whole campaign like that over two days. Um, it was really great. And so, yeah, I'm shooting now outdoors. I, it's funny, isn't it, with the regulations? It's a bit open to interpretation. Yeah. Obviously, in Manchester, socially, we're not allowed in other people's houses or back gardens. But because it's work, um, I know that a lot of photographers are still shooting indoors because it's kind of classed under if you have to work indoors, then, you know, obviously they're wearing masks and what have you. 
personally I, I just don't feel quite comfortable enough about it yet so I'm not shooting indoors um I'm only doing outdoor ones um but you know as soon as it becomes safe and comfortable for me and the families it, it'll be great to be able to go back into homes again the, the mask of course is uh, for many people it, it's this barrier um yeah. and I wonder from a portrait photographer from a successful portrait photographer how you view the mask in context of wearing one with children who can't see your expressions? That's such a good question. It's something that's been really bothering me, actually. And and possibly one of the things that's also um, putting me off doing indoor shoots um, is uh, it's such a, for me, the biggest tool I have is not my camera it's it's me and my relationship with them and how I interact with them and how I make them comfortable and how I play with them and it's kind of that is the biggest that has the biggest impact on the photographs and not just the photographs but their experience of the shoot I want it to be a really enjoyable experience for them I don't want it to be like oh well you know it was like pulling teeth but at least the photos look great yeah. I want them to just say that whole experience was great we had a blast and the photos are great and all of that is you can't really shoot like even if it's documentary photography you can't be just like this silent presence in the corner that's just weird you know you have to it's not like a wedding or something where everything's going on and you can be kind of fly on the wall and blend in and you can't just lurk in the corner of someone's living room saying nothing and you know you've got to interact with them and put them at ease it's so obvious that you're there with them and yeah facial expressions and being able to reassure the children and play with them is such a massive massive part of it and I yeah I mean I've got a mask and I I actually my my mask that I wear you know at home for shopping is just a plain black one but actually I've bought like a like a you know bright rainbow one for (laughs) family shoes to try and look slightly less sinister but it's it's Um, it is always a mask though isn't it that remains exactly it's not going to look friendly because you can't see the smile no no. You can't see a smile properly. You can see it a bit in people's eyes, but I I'm not sure that small children can, you know, it's... it's can such relate small, with you, perhaps. Yeah. yeah. So, so in the, yeah, in, I'm concerned about that, really. In, in that respect, then, uh, are, you, are you likely to... I suppose a lot of photographers are likely to perhaps change their style. For those that think, OK, well, I'm a 24 or 35 millimetre shooter, I like to get in nice and close... Um, yeah. Now you're shooting at, at, at more than arm's distance, certainly more than arm's distance, I would imagine. Yeah, it's um, that's definitely the case for me. My kind of lenses, my workhorse lenses on a shoot are 35 and 24, and I get really close. You know, I'm kind of down on the floor with the kids. I'm, I'm right up close to them usually. So obviously I just can't do that now. Um, that being said, when I shoot outdoors, I tend to use a 35 and 85. So I always have two bodies on me so I don't have to keep changing lenses indoors they're 35 and 24 but when I'm outdoors they're 35 and 85 so when for outdoor shoots it's less of an issue I feel like I can maintain my style a bit more outdoors and um and actually the Although I'm, I know that I can't go up as close, I would still, even with outdoor shoots, I'd be going up close to them usually, and I know I can't do that. Actually, those doorstep shoots were, were great from that perspective and as a really good reassurance because I kind of thought, oh, these are going to be so uncreative and they're going to be really devoid of kind of emotion and I'm going to really struggle Um, and I sort of made it a real challenge to really try and be creative and still capture emotion with them and I feel that I did and it's not obviously you still feel like you've got your hands tied to a certain extent but I know that I can still create those emotive images Mm. from a bit further away Mm. um but I do feel that the mask would be inhibitive, which is is perhaps, as well as safety, another reason why I'm holding off on indoor shoots for the time being. Well, I'm, I'm assuming you didn't, uh, weren't even tempted by the tempted by those remote shots where people were doing, uh, were holding up their iPhones and somebody was directing them. I, I didn't quite grasp the whole whole concept of that, to be honest. Oh, do you mean like the FaceTime? Yes, one? yes, 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 yes. 
Well, I've seen it done really well by um, Tim Dunk has done some amazing ones. Um, and it, I think done well, it's great. I, for me, it's just, I think this is the thing with any kind of photography, isn't it? You've got to find what sits right with you. Just because someone else does something and they make it look and, and they do an amazing job of it doesn't mean that therefore you can and should do it and can do an amazing job of it. I think it's just not it didn't I considered doing it but actually it just didn't massively excite me the thought of doing and I think that it's a non-starter then isn't it if something doesn't excite you then don't even bother trying because you you won't do a good job of something that you're not excited about um but but yeah and I kind of once I started doing the doorstep shoots actually they took so much time um, and energy that I just thought, you know what, I just have not got the <laughs> mental or the capacity to learn <laughs> this other. So no, I didn't attempt that. Are, are you confident for the for the future, Anna? Um, uh, photographers, of course, have gone through a real beating um, yeah. mentally, and you know their businesses have taken a, a crushing blow um, during this period. And many won't return. Well, mo- mo- uh, many yeah. won't come out of this. And maybe through choice, um, there's, well, I just don't want to do this anymore. I've just lost my passion. H- how do you feel? Yeah, I think it's really heartbreaking. I think particularly for wedding photographers, it's just, you know, there's people who have worked so hard for so long and are so talented and they're just on their knees because of this. It's, it's, it's such a shame. Um, well, it's more than a shame. It's a real tragedy, you know, and, um, I think as a family photographer, I'm lucky in that we're going to be able to get back on our feet sooner because we work with smaller numbers. So for me personally, I feel quite lucky that I can kind of see light at the end of the tunnel with this. And we are able to work now still outdoors and you know, people are doing shoots in houses now and they say they're managing to do them safely and comfortably, particularly, I think, for newborns where you don't have to interact with them as much, you know, um, and they're more sort of static. It's easy to keep your distance. And um, so from a photographic point of view, I feel I don't feel there was the initial blind panic for the first couple of months I was terrified really about what was going to happen but now I feel like no I can see it it, it, and I've had a a lot of inquiries it went dead for sort of you know throughout March April nothing I didn't I wasn't even getting like one inquiry and then as restrictions started to lift I've it's been really heartening I've had loads and loads of inquiries and and actually I feel like if anything, for family photography, this whole awful situation actually might have a positive impact on that because people are really valuing their own homes and the, t- the simple times at home with their family, which is what this is all about, and actually seeing the beauty in it and the value in it. And people are also um, become much more sensitive to time passing, you know, and losing, you know, not being able to see family and feeling like you're, you you know, particularly I've seen like newborn babies born, their grandparents haven't been able to see them, you know, and people are much more attuned to not letting moments pass without, you know, acknowledging them and documenting them and valuing them. So actually I think people are very keen for family photography now, possibly more than before even. It's just a, a case of, managing the logistics of it really to keep everybody safe but I also feel it's been a really good breather like you say a chance to kind of reassess and recalibrate in the sort of hamster wheel of shoot edit shoot edit shoot edit it's very hard isn't it to kind of keep to to sort of you often find yourself just going down tracks that you're just going down because of habit Mm. not because they serve you well anymore and so I think a lot of people have actually it's been a chance to stop and go okay was I happy with how my business was what do I want to change what do I want to keep what do I want to grow do I want to do something else altogether and I really hope that this horrendous situation has a silver lining of being able to give a lot of people that chance to sort of 
it's almost a, a bit of a fresh start shooting in the way that they want to shoot doing the things that they want to do um, or not at all if they don't want to anymore I, I hope it will be beneficial for people in the long term if not in the short term uh, thanks to Anna Hardy for her time talking about her family work one of uh, the UK's leading documentary portrait and family shooters as always we'll include details to Anna's site in the show notes at fujicast.co.uk I did also talk to Anna about the job of training photographers and mentoring newcomers to the business, particularly at this time, and the work she does with established photographers, too, on their branding and their launches and relaunches. Uh, And I'll be airing that on Photography Daily on Wednesday's show. That's my other podcast, Photography Daily on Wednesday's show. Remember to let us have your feedback from the interviews, guests we talk with, and of course subjects we discuss, either by leaving a message in the private Facebook group or by emailing click at fujicast.co.uk. Right, back to your questions, Kev. Okay, it's quite a long one. Right, oh, stand by, dig in. It's from Leon Droby. Isn't there a backup system called that? The Droby backup? Droby, no, Drobo. Droby? Oh, Drobo, you're right, uh, not the Droby. It's the, the son of the Joby, the Joby <laughs> no, Joby, well, well, Joby tripod was, and the Drobo his, backup. Yeah, his name was Drobo, yes, but he's not his Leon Droby. Droby. Yeah. Uh, just wanted to keep the show's heart beating, so here's an infusion. What? Oh, yes, we said, um, yeah, uh, we need your questions. They are the heartbeat of the show, aren't they? The type of photography I struggle with the most is event yeah. photography. Oh. And what's a wedding? A big event. A big event, yeah. And you two are the best, so maybe you can right. help. Oh, right. yeah, that's it. It's official. Flattery will get you everywhere. My events are nowhere as large as a wedding. An actual event for me might be a day at the beach with my wife. <laughs> Basically, documenting the day in pictures so someone looking at the photos would have a feel of the day. I start off the day with a photo of making lunches, packing the car, yeah. the packed car, driving down the road, etc. But as the day goes on, the photos become fewer and fewer. They go more from telling a story to random events in the day. Right. At the end of the day, I'll look back at my pics and there's no story to be found. There's usually a couple of very good photographs and every now and then an amazing one. But there's no story. Any idea how to get away from taking amazing random pictures and into telling an amazing story with photographs? Do you not feel that people have, you know, have been absolutely bombarded with this word story? That everything has to have a story when it doesn't? Yeah, I blame Instagram. Yeah, Instagram stories, isn't it? Um, Often you look at the Instagram stories and you think, where's a story here? Yeah. (laughs) Well, there's two points on this, Leon, I think. One is try not to, and I'm sure you don't do it all the time, but try not to feel obliged to make an award-winning Pulitzer Prize story just on a day trip out. Um, because ultimately the most important thing is is having that time with your wife. And, you know, if you don't, sometimes I don't take a camera, sometimes I'll just take some snaps on my phone. And, you know, that's the way it is. Because if I go out thinking today, I want to create something that will tell a story, might sit together in a yeah. body of work, might make a YouTube video out of it or something, then I often find myself having an argument with Gemma at some point, <laughs> generally. So there's not, that... Not the lovely Gemma. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's that element of it. But I, I, I absolutely understand what, yeah. what you're trying to do. And, and when it does come down to the technicalities of storytelling, there's really... If I'm doing something like this and I'm going out for a day out with the kids, I have to say to myself the day before, pretty much, right tomorrow... Mm-hmm. I'm going to tell a story in pictures. Whether it'll be a good story or not, I don't know. But tomorrow I'm going to do it. And then the uh you know the 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 idea of having a date with the family is almost gone really it's more about the story the Mm. the event itself is is peripheral and the things that you have to remember just like with a wedding is to tell a story you need to start a middle and end you've got your start you've got the packing of the lunch the getting into the car etc but you need to be conscious about those three things start middle and end and if you're struggling about those start middle and end points think of the five w's we've talked about this many times who why what where when uh, so really, I, I firmly believe you can tell a story in five pictures. All you need is the who, the what, the why, the where, the when, and you've got your five pictures. And, you know, that will that will help you. That will kind of um, polarise things a little bit when you're telling a story, who, why, what, where, when. Start, middle and end, connecting, context, all those various things. But you really do have to be in the right mindset for it. And, and actually, if you're just going out for a lovely day with the wife, then perhaps that's, you know, that's not going to happen. Maybe, you know, maybe plan it a little bit more. A couple of weeks ago, you had the book by Alan Lebois. Alan, isn't it, the pronunciation? Alain. I don't know. Alain. Yeah, I'm sure it's Alain. Uh, uh, anyway, um, 
don't want to fall out over it. But um, <laughs> otherwise, you'll get that chat writing back in. Excuse me, I'd like to. I'd like to make a complaint. Is this the complaints department? No, that's where the wives. I think you'll find. Actually, he should have written to the wives. Yeah, he got that entirely wrong. We do say that very clearly at the end. Any complaints to the wives, please. Um, but I wouldn't have thought that Alan would be thinking um, <laughs> story every single time because you look at some of his pictures and they are very much standalone. Oh, it doesn't no. have to be a story. I think we're uh, lost in this, this, this necessity to build a story. Absolutely, yeah. But but as uh, Leon says in his email, you know, he often comes back with individual pictures that are brilliant, beautiful. good, yeah. and that's fine. Make a book like uh, Alan doesn't have to be a, a story as such. But if you are creating a story, remember those points. But yeah, absolutely, I agree, with Neil. It, it doesn't, you know, a single picture. I'm I'm looking at a picture right here, which is under my keys. I'm afraid. So hang on. <laughs> Um, and Elliot Irwitt snap uh, snap good god Elliot Irwitt How picture I oh, know and it's you know it's a single picture it's a simple single yeah. picture it's not it, there's a story in that picture but it's one picture that is being sold uh, you know as individual print so yeah absolutely you don't need mm. to you yeah. don't need to be doing stories as such but you're right everybody calls themselves a storyteller and yeah well maybe we all are who knows Jeremy Baker uh, from Facebook by the way if you if you're in the Facebook group um Thank you very much. It's great you can join the FujiCast Facebook group. And we opened up the opportunity recently because I, I know we did it during during lockdown. Do you think we're going to be going back into lockdown, by the way? I, I lost um, just a couple of days ago my uh, my French wedding. I, I was due to go to France. I was very much looking forward to it, actually, at the end of September. But um, yesterday I got an email and it's gone. Yeah, I lost two this yep. morning. Mm. I had uh, my one in Romania, which has finally gone, which I never really thought was going to happen. You weren't surpri- surprised no, by that, No, but they've, they've, they've actually yeah. officially cancelled it now. Yeah. And another one, which was actually in this country, but in September. However, his friend, his family are all French, mm. so they can't no. get here now. So, mm. yeah, that's gone. I don't know whether we're going to lockdown again. I've also, my one of my uh, best mates, Postman Matt, he's in he's in France right now. He comes back tomorrow. Well, he's and then going to have to go into 14 days, isn't well, he? Well, exactly. Yeah. So we all messaged him. So we were having a drink. Um, me, DIY Dave, Lazy Jeff. Dodgy Dave. Big Nick. No, I told him to listen to that. <laughs> uh, Big Nick. Uh Aussie way, no. Yeah. And, um, yeah. and Postman Matt was normally with, with us. Oh, and Welsh oh. Gar was with us. Well, Postman Matt won't be for another two weeks when he gets no, back. but he's... So he, we messaged him last night on WhatsApp at, like, midnight. What are you going to do? You're a postman. You, we're we're gonna, not going to get our letters on Monday. Yeah. And uh, he said, we're packing now. We're heading to Calais. Really? Yeah. So he's racing to get back. Racing. But wow. I think it's absolutely ridiculous. You know, when they say... Four o'clock on Saturday morning. Anybody? What? Well, it so, was rather quick. This one, wasn't it? It's stupid. Yeah, but you have to set a, a line, don't you? Yeah, the line should be when they announce it. They should say, "Right, we're announcing now." Anybody arriving back from France? That'd has be to even quarantine. worse, though, wouldn't it? Well, no, because how can you how can you say that you've got forty eight hours to bring as much of the virus into the country as possible without having to go into quarantine? They they should just. We all live in this mm. thing. We're all they here. Right? It's you know, mm. if you go on holiday to France or wherever you're running the risk of this that's the fact of it and so they should just say right we've we've put our heads together we've decided that france is not on our um whatever they safe list call it them, safe yeah. list so from now on anybody arriving back from Actually, france no, it's not safe list is, no that, that's ridiculous air corridor whatever it makes no sense mm. to say what's going to happen now is you're going to have ten thousand people rush the airports so if one of those people does have the virus yeah it's going to spread like wildfire around the airport because they're all desperate to get back, and they're not going to have to quarantine because they're going to get back at 3.59 on uh, Saturday morning. Yeah. So they're all going to go to work on Monday morning. Oh, I was fine. Whew, I got back just in time. Yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. you've got coronavirus. You're looking a bit hot. Yeah. You know, with a fellow that turns up and four, one minute past 4 a.m., you have to stay at home yeah. for two weeks. It's it's so difficult drawing lines. But the whole thing's difficult. Mm. It's difficult for everybody. Mm. They should just I feel very stop f- about. I feel very sorry for um, I'm not going to say his name because I'm not sure that he would want me to but uh, somebody who's a regular contributor on the show who lives in France and he relies upon the Anglo-French wedding market and that is I would say his year gone 
all of our years are gone. Although, of course, now there are weddings able to take place um, in the UK with the the correct guy. Let me let me look at the gardens actually, Kev. What have we got here? Um, post ceremony receptions from fifteen August. Uh, receptions and other celebrations for weddings and civil partnerships can take place in COVID nineteen secure environments. Uh, capacity at a wedding or civil partnership reception or, or celebration, including the couple, guests, and third party suppliers, but not the venue staff or third party catering staff, should be limited to no more than thirty during all activities linked to, to the reception or celebration. All parties, especially people from separate households and bubbles should adhere to social distancing guidelines, two metres or one metre with risk mitigation. So, I mean, it's, it's, op- it's opening up, um, but it's, it's obviously still not easy, is it, Kev? Honestly, it's, well, I'm it sure it's because he well, doesn't well. want to marry Carrie Fisher, or whatever her name is. <laughs> it's not Carrie Fisher. Oh. oh, dear. Shall I go back to the question? Yes. From Facebook. Um, <laughs> th- thank you very much for, for sending your questions in, into the Facebook group. And uh, this is a great way to, to leave some questions if you don't want to do a longer form email one. Jeremy Baker, X pro question for you, chaps. Not all of us can have the latest and greatest. So what is the best feature and characteristic of each model? Well, we, we can't run through every single one, but uh, X pro one, two and three. So oh. Jeremy sounds like he wants to buy either a one, two or three and is thinking, what would my decision process be? I mean, clearly it's going to have a better sense, but I think I think he wants something a little bit more nuanced than that. Did you ever have an X-Pro1 or two? I did, and I've got it in my cabinet here. X-Pro1. Yeah, I have. So, and I, I, I liked it, and I used it quite a lot, mm. but it was awful in low light. Yeah. It was really, really slow um, when it came to focusing. Yeah. X-Pro2 brought that up a massive notch, and in fact I spent possibly two or three months using that solely as a wedding camera before i just went xt yeah and then got rid of everything to do with x pro although i miss i missed it yeah immediately i consider the x pro one x pro two x pro three a little bit like the uh ford escort market do you yeah you know the classic escorts yeah Asia, which are about your, 50k now that's your x pro one yeah. yeah it's you know a bit bit rubbish around the corners you know it takes takes a bit of looking after costs a lot to repair but actually it's beautiful <laughs> and you get beautiful results from it x pro 2 is a little bit like a uh i don't know what should we call that ford capri but not the injection Ooh. version for capri 2.8 do you know i spent my entire sort of um late teens and early 20s as somebody saying oh, i wouldn't want a capri i wouldn't be seen Oh, I'd never I want always a, wanted a, a one of them. But no, because it was kind of like a bit naff, really, wasn't it, for a while? But now Not they're... in Newport. Really? <laughs> <laughs> it was Utopia. Okay. That's it. Well, That's the right. car everybody wanted to steal. Oh, sorry, darling. I, I, I came from the, the <laughs> south of England, so sorry. Anything less than a 911. I wasn't talking about... <laughs> Uh, no, but no, it was, wasn't it? Really? The, yeah, I agree. I mean, yeah. um, although having said that, um, I went from wanting a Ford Capri to wanting an Opal Manta, <laughs> Manta, which really was, I suppose, the Opal version of. <laughs> but now they 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 fetch a mint, don't they? My um, An absolute mint. They're worth a fortune. Tom, God rest his soul. My father-in-law had his yeah. two point eight yeah. liter injection Ford Capri, oh, which is yeah. the X Pro Three variant. Right. Uh, stolen off his drive, no. stolen to order, gone. Vroomf. So the X Pro Three would be your would be your injection. Yeah, Capri X Pro Three. Oh. So X Pro Three, X Pro Two. I feel there's something. The X Pro One had that original sensor, small megapixel sensor, twelve megapixels, yeah. and it produced amazing JPEGs. X Pro, sorry, X Pro One. One. X Pro One. Is that what? Three. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I meant X Pro yeah. One. One. And it just. We haven't had that since. No. The original X100 and the original X Pro 1, I think, produced the best JPEGs out of the whole series. Now, isn't that funny? Because you, you can almost compare that to, I mean, my feelings about the Canon 5D range, very, very similar. Mm. The pictures that came out the 5D 1, the, the original 5D, oh, they were just, there was kind of like a creamy feel to them. They were fantastic. It was beautiful pictures. Mm. And then as they became more and more perfect and better and better, I, I don't think I enjoyed it quite the same. Yeah, it's, it's that, you know, it's, it's, it's the chase for tech, isn't it? And, uh, I, I, you know, don't get me wrong, the X-Pro3 is by far a much, much better camera mm. and the results are much, much better. But there's there's something different between those the original JPEG quality. And that that's probably just to do with all of the, the stuff that has to fit on the sensor yeah, these days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
So, yeah, my answer to Jeremy would be if you are simply looking for something that you're not going to print too big and it's a, an occasional camera that you just really want to enjoy. A two. X Pro One. No, oh, really? Yeah. Oh, wow. I yeah, thought you might. Beautiful camera. Yeah, okay. Get that. If it's something that you're going to be shooting a little bit more aggressively with and you maybe you want to print a little bit more and maybe you want to dabble in a bit of video, X Pro Two mm-hmm. and X Pro Three if you want uh, to do absolutely everything you need yeah, it to do. Yeah. Enjoy, Jeremy. Right, let's go for this week's book. Um, now, uh, we mentioned Peter Dench um, a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. Now you brought a book in. Yeah, so we mentioned in passing, I think, that I'd, uh, I'd seen some of Peter's work in the Sunday Times. And uh, I mentioned that Monty had eaten my, the, my yeah. one of his books. <laughs> no, yeah. And bless him, Peter, he, 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 he tapped us up on Twitter. Did he? Yeah. Did he hear the episode? Yeah, he said thank wow. you. Did he not read it? He said thank you so much for the kind okay. words on the Fuji Cast guys. <laughs> wow. I'm really sorry that Monty's eaten your book. <laughs> Let me know which one and I'll send you another one, which I, I will not uh, allow him to do that because uh, I... It's not eaten to death, and it no. gives it a little bit of character. I'll tell you what, Peter, if he doesn't want it, I'll have it. <laughs> I'll give you my address instead. Um, but I, So I do have pretty much all of Peter's books, I think. And uh, so I thought, actually, you know what? I don't think we've talked about Peter's books on the on the um, podcast. No, no we so haven't. Let's no, do we've that. talked about them so many times, but not his books. <laughs> yeah. So the one I've got is a Blue Coat Press uh, one, which I think a lot of his stuff has been published by. Blue Coat are a uh, you know, really good UK publisher, backer of independent photographers. And this one's called The British Abroad. And this is kind of about as Peter Dench as you can possibly get. What, what do you mean by that? Well, it's very in your face. There's a lot of flash. It's very close up. And it's honest journalistic photography. So it's literally he's he's gone to places like Benidorm and Magaluf and all of those places. And he spent his time with the British people. And as you can imagine, there are some insane pictures. The one I'm looking at now on oh, page 74 word, is... Uh, They're not doing that in Magalu- Magaluf this year. Sambuca uh, being poured down somebody's throat. Yeah. There's uh, there's a lot of things that... Um, you wouldn't want to believe your kids were doing when they went off for their first holiday with mates. Perhaps wouldn't want your daughters no. doing what's no. going on on page 55. No, nope, definitely Or page not. 54. Or Full 44 colour. and 48 and 49. <laughs> <laughs> Full colour, there's a guy here with, on page 47. Is he he's got he um, He's got all of his... <laughs> he's got all his wristbands on right. from all of the different things he's allowed to go in on his uh, on his holiday. He's got a um, a, a brush a, a, from a dustpan and brush um, padlock to his arm <laughs> on his back. Uh, he's got all kinds of things written, all kinds of drawings of uh, stuff and words. He's clearly fallen asleep on the beach or something, and probably oh, it's his God. stag. Did you have you uh, ever been on a holiday like the 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 photographs Peter no. Dench is making? No. Have, you, have you never been on a? We've well, been on loads of rugby tours. Kev, that must have got well out of hand. Rugby tours are not holidays; they're ordeals. They're what? Ordeals. Ordeals. You come home and go on holiday after a rugby tour. Do you? <laughs> okay. Page thirty-five. Very very brilliant picture. I love this. You've got a guy with his blue um, shorts on, sun, hot sun. Yeah. Uh, his red is pink. His face is pink. Sorry. And then you've got another guy just in front of him. One of his friends got all his trousers on. Has him taking <laughs> them off, just lying there. <laughs> Clearly all doing it, getting rid of their hangovers. Yeah. There's some naked boys in the sea. They're, this is like Brits misbehaving abroad. They're doing the um, what's yeah, that thing? Oops, upside your head or whatever it's called yeah. on the boat. Yeah. They're on one of those boat parties. If you've ever seen um, The Inbetweeners, the movie, when they go to Spain. Do you know, I was just about to say, this is this is like The Inbetweeners annual. <laughs> this is it. Uh, and it's wonderful. It's Honestly, brilliant. it's, it's wonderful. Yeah. I, uh, yeah, look yeah, at that yeah. guy there. It's life, isn't it? It's uh, Yeah, it's life. And, and you know what? All these kids, I'm sure, will be uh, had a lovely time and will be... I shouldn't think they ever remembered Peter taking a picture. Building their uh, their lives and their careers right now. Um, so good for them. And uh, yeah, no, I think it's great. And so I love th- this 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 glimpse into yeah. into this stuff we all see and hear about. Um, and oh, that's one of those yeah. foam parties. <laughs> yeah. Now, yes, I've been to a foam party. Ah, oh, here we go. <laughs> Not of late, I might add. We are talking about twenty years ago. Look this- at that. The, hanging oh, yeah. the Union Jack flag outside your hotel Union flag. window. Union flag. It's not a jack. Union flag, sorry. It's only a Union Jack when it's hung, hung off the back of a, a ship, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. <sighs> <laughs> 
Why are you yawning? <laughs> uh, anyway, sorry, we've gone right off. You were talking about your phone party. Yeah. No, no, don't um, worry about the phone party. That's for another day. But yeah, so anyway, Peter Peter Dench has got a whole series of books based on um, British So this culture. one is called The British Abroad. This is called The British Abroad. And, and, it, and, it, press. And, it, and it's pretty accurate, I think. I think it's very accurate. Yeah. yeah. And it's, uh, it's a real kind of eye-opener. Although actually not that much of an eye-opener. Still in print, obviously. Yes, I think so. Um, and I do you know uh, that's a square format book as well, isn't it? I yeah. Love, I, is, yeah. It is it square or is it just a little no. bit beyond the square? I, I think you might maybe, be right. maybe just a tad. I, I don't know. Yeah, but it's uh, that's one thing I kind of forgot to mention that. But uh, yeah, it's it's got good spreads on it. Nice big pictures, like I say, all color. Um, and I, I think like, I like the weighting uh, when with square books. It's an odd thing to say now, but I, with a square book, I like the weighting of a rectangle at the top of the page. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Anyway. £19.99, it says on my little inlay. Probably. There we go. OK, um, question. Um, Daniel Parks in Birmingham. Um, morning, Kev. Morning, Neil. Uh, my question is linked to the restrictions around the pandemic, although it may have applied before lockdown came into force too. I'm interested to know if your shooting approach changes drastically depending on the size of the event you're going to, in our case, weddings. I feel like I've been two years in the making of preparation, research, confidence building regarding the, the type of photos that are important to capture at a wedding. The arty bridal prep pictures, the friends laughing over a pint, the crazy dan dancing on the dance floor. As I sit here on the brink of launching as a wedding photographer, I feel like the goalposts have moved. I imagine that shooting a small low-key event at a registry office requires a different mindset to a full-day event full of pomp and fanfare. Would you say it requires more creativity photographically? There's a few questions here, so let's deal with that one first. Do you think, it, 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 think shooting a, a smaller event requires more creative pho photography or or the other way around larger event it depends a bit on the style really i think if you're photographing photojournalistically then i think you have to be a little bit more creative with the light and where you position yourself yeah. and there's there's going to be less things going on so mm. you're, you're going to be using light as a as a crux a bit more uh, well, Dan, Daniel said you find yourself scraping the barrel for inspiration when it comes to finding scenes that can be composed in the way you like them when you've got less to photograph well again if it's photojournalistic then you can only photograph what's in front of you with the caveat that you can move yourself around you can look for good light uh, you know many people who shoot photojournalistically in inverted commas will tell people where to stand and what to do and laugh at the camera and all that, pretend it's it's natural. And, and that's fine if that's what the clients are, are expecting. But if you're not doing that, then you are you will find yourself frustrated. Mm. However, saying that, if you're more of a creative photographer who's directing things and, you know, staging stuff, then, then you know, you are... That's part of your skill set is to is to think about backgrounds, think about compositions and that kind of stuff, isn't I it? I remember being at a hotel in London. What's that one? Oh, it's a, it's a, I think it's the Grosvenor. Mm -hmm. Is it the Grosvenor? Just off Park Lane. Yeah. They have a suite, rather than a very, very small suite, tiny. You usually have weddings of only about, I don't know, between 10 and 20 people up there. And I found myself all night long, just the same 15 to 20 people, mm -hmm. Just at that point, thinking, right, I'm going to photograph for half an hour, making images that illuminate half the faces or detail from those standing closest to these very distinctive wall lamps with uh, with red shades. They were, Kevin. That that created an island of images from the evening that were were artistically different to everything else that day and, and evening. Mm. I think you almost have to find a theme, don't you? Yeah, definitely. You've got to start looking for things. Mm. Um, and, and again, we've talked about this before. Record some audio, listen to the audio, and that will give you a good yes. insight to what's going on around you. Um, yeah, but yeah, challenging. Smaller weddings are challenging. I know you do that at your um, at your street gigs, yeah. don't you? Your, yeah. Are you, have you got Remember some street, them? street ones coming up? No. No? no it's still not really. I'm, technically, you can go, but not allowed to stand within two metres of each other. Mm. And, you know, what's the fun in that? Mm. Suck the entire fun out of life. Mm. Do you want to do a question? <laughs> Or should we give up and go on? <laughs> I'm just going to go there and headbutt the wall. Um, okay, so this is a question from... Last one of the week. Last one of the week. Then it's going to be from Facebook, and it's from our moderator, Steve Vaughan. Oh, yes. Steve Vaughan says, question for Kevin. Hmm. I believe he used to shoot just JPEGs for weddings, but now shoots mostly raw. I think Andrew Billington and David Stubbs also shoot JPEG. 
We've tried both, but are back with Raw at present. That's that is when we have weddings again. What made Kev switch, and would he go back? What I, you, I, sh- I shot uh, JPEG for a long, long time, and in fact, before all this hell started, I'd started to go back to JPEG again, mm. and mainly because. Um, you know, you're using a mirrorless camera, so you can pretty much nail the exposure every single time. So that's not an issue. Really, do like the uh, the film simulations, and um, yeah, I, I've I've been really happy shooting JPEG again. Yeah, I mean, you know, I I did used to shoot just JPEG, but that was in the one card days. Mm. Uh, and since the two card systems come along, I've shot JPEG plus RAW in most cases. And uh, so I still process from the JPEGs in a lot of cases. But actually, you know, when I have built a raw processing workflow that works yeah. really well for me, yeah. gets me the look that I really want. And, and I could, with the JPEGs, I can almost get there. But ultimately, it's come down to the fact that the, the computers and software and everything are much faster these days. Mm. It's not a drama. The storage space, everything is in the cloud. You know, it's just the... The, the bottlenecks that used to be there are no longer there, but the JPEGs are still shot. I still shoot them, um, and in you know, in the vast majority of the cases, I'll just tweak those, and away I go. But you know, it's I, I kind of it's a very valid question. It's a bit like the Mac versus Apple, uh, sorry, Mac versus Windows debate. Yeah. There's no right or wrong. It's entirely up to whatever works for you. Um, however, as you will know, I do have some raw presets available. <laughs> Well, it's a good time to mention it. Where are they available, Kev? Anywhere. Just type my name in and chuck me some money. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Kev. Well, that's it for this week's uh, show. Thank you to this week's guest, Anna Hardy. Um, if you've liked any of this uh, of, of the show, thank you. And, of course, you can comment within the Facebook group. That's where you can uh, start to feedback on the stuff that we've been talking about. And, of course, now you can leave some questions for next week or the week after the show as well. So do so in there. Or you can email one in. Um, click at fujicast.co.uk. Uh, this week's book, of course, was um, was Peter Dench's The British Abroad. The British Abroad, which is which is brilliant. And still in print. And still in print. Don't forget our website, of course, fujicast.co.uk. All of the show notes and everything, all the links to the books and all of the... I, I will often find little videos of our guests and pictures and links. And you can still purchase the tour box uh, with a discount of Fujicast exclusive. Oh, yes, the discount yeah, is still we, on the website. Yeah. Even though the competition's finished, um, congratulations to Jenna for having the baby and her husband for taking that wonderful picture. And uh, yeah, all the other stuff is on the website. Are you still using your tour box, by the way? Yeah. I just wondered if there's another thing I could borrow off you and never give back. <laughs> uh, you got my 35 mil. Oh, let me have a quick look for your 35 mil. Um, no, I don't appear to. <laughs> But even if I did find it, I probably would never tell you now. <laughs> music is from Blue Wednesday, supporting music from the incredible artlist.io. And if you'd like to see our offerings to the photo community, visit fujicast.co.uk. Lots of info about today's show, links, etc. A stack load of resources, as Kev says. And we will see you next week. Bye bye. Bye bye. The Fujicast is an independent loading zone production. Email the show with your questions and words of wisdom to click at fujicast.co.uk. Email any complaints and political nonsense to our wives who will deal with your comments in their own good time and in their own good way.